Good morning, everybody. Hello, it's good to see you all here. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Wow, I feel I'm under the really bright lights and the sun's shining. It's a good day to be here at 1111. Thanks for coming. <laughs> We're still gathering, obviously. Tom is in Germany. We're missing him. Uh, and so maybe uh, we'll wave toward the camera or something and say hello to him if he's getting to watch. I hope you've had a good week. I hope if you are having a hard time today that something we say here will encourage you and help you. That is why we get together after all, right? Um, we have a good service planned. You're going to love the music and uh, hope you'll fill out your registration cards. Hope you'll pay attention to the announcements on back, including the red, ba red bags, which I talked to you about last week, it's great. They're almost all gone. So um, if you didn't get one, you might check in the Welcome Center. If you did bring one back, the tables are out in the hallway. And we will be moving those things to the foundation building, which is our little building right there. Someone has uh, graciously become an elf and taken care of a lot more of it than I thought. So maybe there won't be much to do. And... Um, Maybe you can just check and, and see if people are walking to the foundation building with bags you can join in after church. It won't take long if we all do it. So let's get going, and we will begin with the lighting of the wreath. In keeping with our tradition, we light candles during Advent. And today we light the candle of love with hope and intention that we may be the light of Christ's love wherever we go. And if you all will read with me, it's in your bulletin. If you've been here before, you know what the drill, right? Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again. <laughs>
gonna win this race. Love will run out of time. Pull yourself up from behind. Holy One, we're here together celebrating that love throws us a line from time to time. We give thanks for all the ways in which we find ourselves surrounded by love. We give thanks for the opportunities that we have to love. And we hope together that we will become people who more and more lean into the ways of love so that there can be light in the darkness. And this we pray because of our faith and in the name of the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. Hey, good morning. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Y'all want to stand and sing with us? We're not doing a Christmas song yet. It's still just like a good old song to sing together, but I invite y'all to jump in on this with us. One, the last line in that song is the best. You may believe that the kingdom is in you. I think that's why that song has stuck around so long with us. Huh? Yeah. Two, 
Now is a great time to bring your offering to the table if you're not one of the hundred people that already did. Three, let's offer one another a sign of peace like you mean it. Oh, yes. Let's go. Well, everyone, we're delighted to have Bob and Evelyn back with us with a message from the Eggnog Association. And as she just said, a message from the Eggnog Association. <laughs> Things have been pretty bright these last few months for Bob and me. We were tired of being embarrassed by our kids' behavior at church, so we've been vi visiting a different church each Sunday in Advent. <laughs> sure, it's been 10 years since our kids were in church, but they had quite a reputation. <laughs> now that they're living in a commune in Montana, there's far less chance of them embarrassing us at new churches, and we get to reinvent ourselves every Sunday. We decided that this coming Sunday, We'll visit a new church out in the country as singles who meet for the first time. <laughs> we'll fall in love with each other, and Bob will propose to me all before the members leave the church. <laughs> we'll thank them for being there and giving us this place to meet. It'll be such a nice Christmas gift for a small, dying congregation. It's our Christmas gift to the world, and it doesn't cost us a thing, Evelyn. Oh, Bob. Anyway, we've been having fun being anonymous in churches after years of feeling guilty every time our old pastor looked down at that certain judgmental point in the sermon. That's right, Evelyn. <laughs> Pastors never condemn the visitors. <laughs> <laughs> so we just keep moving from church to church and making folks feel like they've made a difference in some older couple's life. Of course, they'll never see us again. Oh, Bob. <laughs> Stop being so negative. I thought you'd been pretty happy this year. I'm just being realistic, Evelyn. Like you were the other night when those folks came by the house. You were so rude. They could have been casing the joint. Thieves. The joint? Our house, Evelyn. There's been a rash of house thefts and package thefts in the neighborhood. I was just being careful. Bob, there were 12 of them, and they were singing carols. <laughs> Thieves are pretty clever these days. They had their kids with them, and you were shouting, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you in jail. I was just sharing some Christmas spirit by quoting that movie we watch every year. Mr. Potter is not an example of the Christmas spirit. Bob, they just wanted to spread a little comfort and joy and share some of the love in their hearts. I don't like feeling manipulated. So you shout a Merry Christmas to filthy animals and started making machine gun sounds? From my second favorite Christmas movie, Home Alone 2. It sounded like you were gagging and choking. They could hear it outside, and one of them started to call 911 until I went to the door and told them everything was okay, and you were just watching. You shouldn't have opened the door. They might have seen something. Bob, Bob, I think we need to get out the eggnog. Eggnog has mellowing agents and natural antioxidants like egg and nutmeg to help alleviate the fear and lift the heart in song. I think I'll get some now. Maybe tonight they'll be back by and we can join in the chorus this time. Brought to you by the Eggnog Association.
Children, we believe the grandest sight to see is something lovely wrapped beneath the tree. Good morning. I'll be reading from 1 John 4. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. Next, I'll be reading from Job 10:12. No one has ever seen God. 
But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. You, God, have granted me life, mercy, and loving kindness, and your care has preserved my spirit. I don't know if you've ever seen a kingfisher. Uh, it's a sort of a small, diminutive bird uh, that uh, lives near water, and as the name suggests, they fish uh, and leap down in the water and swim. So if you're ever near the Trinity River or any body of water and you hear sort of a staccato-like sound, almost like a, uh, a rattlesnake rattle being rattled really fast, it has that, a call like that and quite loud, then look around and see if you see something flying through the air really quickly. Those are kingfishers, and they're really neat birds. I don't know too many animals so crammed with vivacity. Um, this is a poem called Kingfisher Catch Fire by Gerard uh, Manley Hopkins. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame, as tumbled over rim in roundy wells. Stones ring, like each tucked string tells, each hung bells, bow swung finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. Deals out that indoors each one dwells, sells, goes itself. Myself it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace, that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not hands, to the Father through the features of men's faces. Thank you. Thank you, all of you who've brought us this far. We've lit the Advent candle of love, and you know, it's hard to know if it's good news or bad news when it's your turn to speak about love. I mean, it's a big target. It'd be kind of hard for me to miss it, right? But on the other hand, what else can we say about love? But that, that's the thing about love, right? There are no words, and there are so many words. Sometimes we feel so overwhelmed by love, you've been here, that you just don't know what to say but you try anyway. And so we stretch the corners of language. We stretch the language corners and we stretch them to the corners to try to say what it is that we're feeling about love. Love is the subject and the object of our lives. We want it, we give it, we receive it, we remember it. Its absence breaks us. Its presence heals us and sustains us. Love is what we were made for. And in the language of faith, love is another name for God and for us today, for Christ. Even for all this, for all the prevalence and powerful influence of love in our lives, sometimes we still focus too much on lesser things. Now, those lesser things are important. We cannot ignore them. We cannot pretend them away. But if we have any hope of addressing the problems that face us as a small community in our families, in our world, if we have any hope of addressing them, it will be because we've spent a lot of time focusing on love and gaining power from that focus. And so, after all, it is a good thing to get to talk about love today to talk about and tell stories about when everyone else leaves, love shows up. How that love throws a line. How that when all seems lost, sometimes love finds us in spite of us. And how that just saying I love you makes love grow in us. The poet, Gerald Manley Hopkins, wrote, Christ plays in 10,000 places. And he was saying in his unusual syntax something that Christians have insisted on forever, and that is that the Christ may be seen in me and in you, and it is our task to seek out the Christ wherever and to be the Christ wherever. Jesus said, when you feed the hungry, 
when you clothe the naked, when you visit people who are in prison or people who are sick, you have done it, Jesus said, for me and to me. And so what do we do? Well, we get out there and do it. We build churches. We build hospitals. We work in schools. We work in social service agencies. We are philanthropists and neighbors and friends, and we are people who get out there and love. And in this way, Christ plays in us. I read an article the other day, and I want to tell you that it doesn't really matter when this article was written. It could have been four years ago, eight years ago, 24, 40 years ago. It doesn't matter. The effect would have been the same. The writer was talking about the fact that after every national election, those whose candidate lose loses, uh, spend a lot of time lamenting, well, now the whole nation is going to fall apart, we say. And again, it really doesn't matter when that was written, because whenever your team loses, that's how you feel, right? But his point was that our values of decency and compassion are not as dependent on who's in the higher offices as we might sometimes think. It's the people on the ground. It's us. It's the institutions closest to home that keep the fires of love burning. And so again, what do we do? We work in schools. We work in hospitals. We work in social service agencies. We work in nonprofits. We become neighbors to each other. We're kind to random strangers and they to us. Christ plays in 10,000 places. There's an example of this that I want to tell you about. I went to a luncheon just a few weeks ago, and it was actually hosted by one of our own members who is here today, Rosie Moncrief. The, the purpose of this luncheon was to raise awareness about sex trafficking in our city. And the stories were told in the only way they could be told, and that is in heartbreaking terms. The pro... The, the Star-Telegram has recently run some articles about it, and you can read their details about how it is that children and, and young people and adults get caught up and are victimized. The articles also tell some stories about successful sting operations, as our law enforcement and social service agencies have worked on this. And you can Google those articles if you want to. But for our purposes, I want to tell you about the people who are working on this problem. Among them is a task force here in town, it's been together since about 2014, called Five Stones. Our own Kim Bushlow, sitting right over there, is on this task force, and I have now joined it as well. I guess Five Stones is named for the five stones that David took to kill the giant. I, I didn't ask anybody, but it makes sense to me. The force is divided up into several subgroups. One group is working with the victims, and they're providing help and resources for the very long journey of healing that must take place after this trauma. One group works uh, in education. They're, they're educating the public, people like me. They're educating other social service workers who need to know more about how to best address this and work with the victims. They're, they're uh, educating uh, people in the mental health field and in the physical health field. So they're working on education. Some others are working on prevention. They're reaching out to kids, uh, at-risk kids. They're offering services that would meet needs which, uh, when are unmet, certainly contributes to how kids might get caught up in something like this. Another group works on advocacy, and they're staying on top of local and state policies and, and legislation that is affecting this work and that affects the victims and the perpetrators. One group of women, or maybe some men too, go into the strip clubs to visit with women who are there to find out if they want out. They're throwing a line, actually. They're taking little, little packets, little bags of gifts, and they have like lip gloss and stuff like that in them. But always inside those bags is a little note that says, you are loved. The woman telling this story about her committee work said she went back to visit one of those clubs for a second visit to see if there's anyone there to talk with her, and she saw one of those notes taped on the mirror. It meant something. Whether or not the women in that particular club respond, we won't know for sure, but we will know the message has been delivered and that it mattered to someone. The final group that gave its report at this task force meeting are the people who work with the perpetrators. 
And the guy speaking said, yeah, yeah, I know. What you want to do is throw these people in jail and throw away the key. And he said, but our group, in our group, we're trying to overcome that. We're trying to work to rehabilitate because we want to help them recover their humanity. I heard all of this knowing that this 10,000 places would be my jumping off point for this sermon, and I thought, yeah. Well, here's another story. It runs in a different direction. There's a composer named uh, David Lang. He's a Grammy Award-winning composer, and he is about to perform a piece of music which he prepared to be played on broken instruments, 400 of them, and the musicians, 400 of them, aged from 8 to 8 years old to 83 years old. (laughs) Some of them are novices. Now, some of the instruments have been repaired, but it's going to be an interesting performance. These broken instruments are from the Philadelphia school system. They came to the attention of an art curator who was just, for some reason, visiting an unused high school. And in the gym, the abandoned gym, he saw all these beautiful pianos pushed up against the wall, and he thought, oh, my goodness, Where's the rest of them? And, and are there other instruments? So he calls the school district. I love this guy, don't you? He calls the school district and he says, where are the instruments that used to be here? And certainly now he's talking about several schools. Well, he's collected 1,500 broken instruments, started a fundraiser and has begun to repair them and has repaired 500 of them, returning them to the schools so that kids can play. Also, Uh, sending with them um, repair kits so that people will know how to make minor repairs. So this composer heard about all this, and he wanted to get involved because he said, this is more than a musical project. This is a social and community project. And so he said, we're going to use this music to heal the community. The broken instruments, he says, have a message beyond themselves because They're broken like people are, how we break into tribes and groups and we go against each other. But that is not what we learn in music, he said. In music, we learn to come together to make something great that we are making. And we sure need more of that today, the composer said. And I thought, well, the light of Christ in broken instruments, where we least expect it sometimes, right? One more story. This one's less dramatic, but nonetheless, great story. Um, I read on a blog, and so this young woman gets a chance to learn again to appreciate where she is in life. So she goes to the grocery store with four kids. One of them is a baby on her back in one of those little pouch things. One of them is a three-year-old saying her belly's aching, and she's just got to have that donut because she didn't get to eat her lunch before she came to the grocery store. The other is a six-year-old boy turning everything inside into a weapon so he can aggravate his brother, who is seven, who has one dollar in his pocket, and he's got to spend it right now. And so you can imagine that mom is a little frazzled on this shopping trip, and she's probably been in that place before, but she's making it through. She's getting done. Finally, she gets to the checkout line, and Uh, gets over there to the place where you put your buggy back up. And as she was doing that, she turned, and there's a woman about 30 years older than her coming up. And the woman starts chit-chatting. And I'm sure the young mother's thinking, I just got to get in the car. But the young woman, the the older woman says, I I saw you in the store, and and I know what you're doing is really hard. She said, I kind of miss those days when my kids were with me. I don't miss the hard part, but, but I miss the sweetness of it. And then the older lady said, let me take a picture of you. And so and in the blog, the picture is shown, and she says, you know, we looked better than I thought. <laughs> and she said, before that woman walked away, she looked at me and said, I just want you to always remember that what you're doing matters. Being a mom matters. As you might imagine, that young woman was moved by the kindness of this reminder. And it was one of those times when love passes between you and you know it and you feel it and somebody has known you, somebody knows you're in a struggle and that what you're doing is hard. 
and there's not enough words to talk about that feeling. But we're talking about human connection. We're talking about acknowledging the life of another. We're talking about just saying what you're doing is important. We're talking about throwing a line. So I'm going to invite the band to come back. We all have to tell these stories. I think I jumped the gun on you. I gave them a cue, and then I did it wrong. We all have to tell stories about the 10,000 ways that love shows up, not because telling these stories will rescue every, every person who's trafficked, not because it completely restores the community to tell a story like this or to even show an act of love, not because if we tell this story, little Brady will quit aggravating his brother. No, we tell these stories because we are honoring the efforts of love. We are honoring the surprises of love, and we are saying again that love is always there and that love sustains us. You and I are among those 10,000 places, but maybe we have to remind ourselves of that again from time to time. And so that's what we're doing here with the lighting of this candle. Maybe we need to remember that one of the enduring meanings of the story we tell every Christmas is that when God became flesh, it was a validation of our humanity. It was a one more time of pronouncing that humanity is good. We are good. People are good. And you and I are part of this goodness. We're part of this scheme. We're part of this divine order of things to bring love into the world. And so together, never giving up on stemming the tide of injustice, never losing faith in the value of a single kind word, and never doubting that just saying, I love you, will make love grow in us.
Well, that's a great way to start Advent, don't you think? Well, let's stand together, take a hand, we'll have a blessing. Hope you'll be back next week for the second Sunday of Advent. Holy One, we're grateful for so many things. For goodness that we don't even know about, we're so grateful it's there. We're grateful for the love that we do see in the eyes of our friends and in the work that they do in the world. We're grateful that it counts to do something small and kind. As we go, may we go with encouragement and hope. We pray this in the name of the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. All right, let's sing. <laughs> Join us on the scene. Love came down at Christmas. Love, love, me, love, divine. Love was born at Christmas. Stars and angels gave the sign. All right. Shall be a token, love be a
Just call. 